then his other uh, job was uh, for the, for the OSSN was to get copies he said nine copies of everything that was printed um, in Japanese controlled Philippines and he told me that one day and I got to go away and thought about it and came back the next day and I says well gee that seemed kind of a how did you do that dad and he said well at that point in time it didn't take it, it took you had to have a big room to print things and you had to have a big machine and a lot of supplies and a lot of people so he said he would just compromise at least three people at every place there was a printing press and he would get his copies he said the hardest thing he had to get was the, uh, the mimeographs and then well make a little bit of a long story short Dr. Hayden died and my dad uh, started even working he'd been working with the guerrillas and when Dr. Hayden died my dad took his place and started to work a lot with the guerrillas and he uh, went into Manila way before the American troops and with the guerrillas sequestered the puppet government's uh, library and papers. And when he did that, he, uh, uh, working with the guerrillas, he, they, they helped set, he was helping set up the, uh, the new government and helped setting up their diplomatic mission and they had to put a bunch of the collaborators in jail. The, the Filipinos who had collaborated with the Japanese and in, in Philippines there's a very thin oligarchy and most of the oligarchy collab collaborated with the Japanese well MacArthur was raised in the Philippines and most of those people were his friends when MacArthur got to uh, uh, Manila he found his friends in jail and he found it was my dad that was uh, uh, the one uh, person responsible and he said get rid of my dad now the person he brought in, let me see if this works here. Oh well. Well the person the person he brought in to take take my dad's place was an Edward G. Lansdale. Now I don't know if you've heard much of Edward Lansdale before, but there are plenty of people there's pictures of this man walking in Dallas. He's got a little uh, earphone with a wire going down his down his back and uh, there's plenty of people say that was Edwin Lansdale in Dallas okay and you see things like the Kennedy assassination don't just happen because somebody said oh some afternoon oh let's kill the president okay these operations take a long time to build up okay you have a person who's a scriptwriter and there's a lot of researchers who say that Mr. Lansdale was the scriptwriter, because he he would do things, uh, he would do fake battles. He started doing fake battles in the Philippines, and then he did a big fake battle in 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 Vietnam, because, you know, my uh, my father quit the CIA in 1959, moved the whole family out to Oregon. Then he started talking to me in 1969. I didn't believe him, didn't understand him first words out of his mouth to me were the Vietnam War is about drugs there's these secret societies behind it said, okay and then uh, then he says and communism's all a sham these same secret societies are behind it all it's all a big game now I'm thinking my dad's absolutely nuts okay I'm a teenager he's talking about drugs okay I, I know more about drugs than my dad does you know and then it, a little light bulb comes in my head and I th think okay I mean it's the late 60s I'm growing my hair long I'm oh dad's gonna have the drug talk with me he hadn't had the other talk with me I already had a six-year-old I mean a six-month-old baby so um, I, I start to straighten up and you know I'm getting ready for my dad to say stop stop smoking pot he doesn't do that he tells me about his intelligence career all the way back to the 30s which had never been discussed in the house at all and then he starts telling me about how they're playing out a loose scenario in Vietnam. Okay, this is 1969. Okay, and then uh, they start talking about psychological warfare and propaganda and stuff. It soon becomes very apparent. I have no idea what they're talking about. I have no frame of reference. It's the late 60s. I've got a record store. I've got a family. I'm putting on rock and roll dances and stuff. So. You know, but he's my daddy, so I'm I'm listening to him, and doesn't make much sense to me. And then we had some other conversations and some arguments. Learned learned quite a bit. And one one thing he told me, 
He says they're out to opiate your whole generation. Okay, now what does that have to do with the JFK assassination and everything? Well, there's a very good book out there I'm going to recommend. It's called Generations, A History of America's Future from 1529 to 2060-something. Okay, and these, it's out of sociology, and these people went back to the 12th century, actually, and show that there's these four generations that go through history that help each other and move us, move us forward. Okay, so in that book, they talk about a generation that didn't cohere in the 1860s. Okay, and they didn't, they didn't come together. Some of them joined the generation before. Some of them joined the generation after. Some of them just went out in the woods and did weird stuff. Okay, well, in there the the analysis in, in in is because it happened because of the assassination and war, and there was another thing that they don't talk about. It was opium. It was was why that generation didn't cohere. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, when you have four cylinders in the engine, it runs pretty good. When you only get three cylinders. It makes us, as a society, much more susceptible to these sinister forces in the shadows, to their manipulations. Okay, and so you had a, a situation after the uh, Civil War. They, it's hard to get the Americans to go back to war because there's a lot of death happened. But through yellow journalism and uh, false flag event, uh, the main did not blow up because the Spanish put a, uh, what do you call it, a bomb on the outside. Uh, there was an admiral that did a study later on and he found that the explosion happened inside the ship and went out. Okay, so it was a false flag event to get the American public all up in things and go to war against Spain. Well, we didn't go to Cuba right away, but we went to the Philippines right away because the Philippines, Manila is the oldest, uh, port in uh, western port in the far east and it's very important to opium smugglers because the secret society my father was talking about skull and bones skull and bones was started by alfonso taft and william huntington russell they uh, william huntington russell's family was the number one opium smuggler in america the third largest in the world and uh, so they tried again to get, to get rid of us, to, to get rid of a, a generation. And to go back, we had the Spanish-American War, and then every generation, you know, every 20 years we had a war. We had World War I and World War II. Okay? So why are they trying to opiate the, the boomer generation? Again, they, they do not want this generation to cohere. They want us to be a pieced out, drugged out generation. Okay? As an antithesis to our parents' generation of war. Okay? So then they've got a hat rack in the room that they can talk about, scare people, start the war on drugs, start the assault on their constitution. Okay, because another thing, to, to do this operation, they had a target date of 1950. Okay, and, and by 1950 they wanted to have in place television, which is a technological means of mind control. They wanted to have in the modern education system, which we have been dumbed down terribly. I mean, you look at the 18, the eighth grade test from the 1880s, most college people could not uh, pass them. I mean, our founding fathers were the last fully trained classical educated generation. Johann Wolfgang Fichte in his third address to the German people in 1805 says, we're going to take your children, we're going to teach them what and how and when to think. Okay. And so they dropped a bunch of subjects out of the classical education. Classical education, your number one subject was dialectic logics, okay? And you were taught rhetoric, and you were, you were taught civics, and you were taught these things so that you could stand on your own two feet and be a human being and not be manipulated, okay? The Prussian education system, which was brought over here by Dewey and Mann, uh, they found that if they took the subjects, broke them apart, taught them for about an hour and put bells in between. Sound familiar? Okay. They could then create a false construct around us and dumb us down and move us in the direction that they wanted. Okay. And 
you know, I, I come from a family of teachers and superintendents of schools, and, you know, I didn't want to believe that, you know. But if you, if you look at it and do the reading, it's, it's what's happened. We've been terribly dumbed down, okay. And then the other thing they wanted to have in place was a, a nascent drug culture, okay. So, uh, you know, and out there in the 60s, they would, you know, you'd find there, there'd be pot all the time, and then all of a sudden the pot would be gone, they'd flood the, uh, the market with heroin and stuff like that. And they didn't just do it in the United States, they did it in, in, in Australia, they did it in, in, in England and, and in Europe too, okay. And, but one thing that happened was a bunch of us kids, we didn't go to the heroin. There were some things that happened. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a real long story, but uh, LSD was a little bit of a uh, wild card because LSD didn't get invented until 38, and he didn't really figure out what it was until 43, and they'd been planning this for, for quite a while, okay? I mean, they, they used LSD too, but LSD is a, is a bit of a wild card. But basically, what happened was the boomers did cohere, okay? We cohered as hippies around a joint being smoked around a circle, okay? And that, that comes from New Orleans and Jackson Square here. But, um, and, and what came out of the hippies? The History Channel did a big two-hour special. And what came out of the hippies was a personal computer and the internet, okay? So those are the tools that we as a society are using to fight the corruption. Because that's all it is, it's just corruption. It's just people lying to us okay and taking advantage of us okay and and to stop it all we need to do is there's way more of us than there are them and we need to stand up that's, that's, that's all we need to do and you guys are standing up by being here today and I really appreciate that okay and Judy Lord have mercy you know this lady is standing up I mean, I've been with her many days and, and seen her speak many times, seen her connect with the audiences, okay, because she's passionate. She's passionate about her country. She's a passionate about what happened to John F. Kennedy. She's passionate about Lee Harvey Oswald, that, you know, he has been wronged. That's why, I mean, when we first did me and Lee, um, when the hardcover, she wouldn't, you know, she'd been attacked and uh, had too many accidents and stuff. She wouldn't, she wouldn't come to the United States. I said, come on, Judy, your, your book's going to come out. You're going to meet people. She said, no, she, 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 wouldn't, she wouldn't come. Finally, when her soft cover came out, we says, well, Judy, how about coming to Toronto? She says, okay. So we went to Toronto and had a, a, a wonderful reception. We had uh, uh, newspaper, TV, all kinds of stuff. Of course, none of it really translated down to Buffalo or anything like that. And, and uh, one thing we did there, you know, I asked her, I says, well, you know, book's coming out around September. I says, when's a good time? And she says, well, how about Lee's birthday, October 18th? I says, okay. So we, we did that in Toronto. We ce celebrated Lee, Lee's birthday. And you know, it, it came to me. That's a huge political act. Okay, I mean, that's, that's like Rose getting on the bus. Okay, I mean, Lee Oswald was this vile person who, you know, they always tell us he shot the president, right? You know, and here this lady comes along and she wants to celebrate his birthday. So we've been, start, we've been doing that. And once we started doing that, the reception and the crowds have been continually growing. Because I, I, myself, I, I want my country back, okay? I, I, I don't like the situation we're in today, okay? And that's how we're going to get it back, is by doing political acts and by standing up. So I'm just, you know, thrilled to... Uh, I, I, I wish there was a big company that was a publisher, but, you know, they ain't doing it, you know? So I'm just uh, uh, thrilled to uh, publish your books. And uh, I'm not going to take too much more time and get Judy up here because she has lots to say. And God bless.
Oh, wait, a question. 